worshiping either in person or later online. On this second Sunday after Epiphany, we are renewed by good news, sorry, by the good news of the Word and by the Sacrament of Holy Communion. We receive a wafer as we enter the sanctuary. At the time of the communion invitation, when I say the body and blood of Christ given and shed for you, we sit and eat the bread in our pews. Then we're invited to come up the center aisle, socially distanced, to receive the wine and the juice. The pre-filled glasses and trays are on the table at the foot of the chancel stairs. After taking a glass, please go to the side and drink. And there is a bowl for the glasses as you go back via the side aisles. We have fellowship hour each Sunday following worship in Emmanuel Hall. And the platform lifts available for those who can't access the basement via the stairs. During worship, you're able to share your offerings at the entrance to the sanctuary. Envelopes for Sunday and special offerings are available in the pews. And instead of numbered sets, again this year we're giving you bundles of, bundles of supplies of undated envelopes. To pick up your bundle for this year, see Linda Sander or call the office during the week. Congregational Council is having its January meeting this Tuesday at 5 p.m. Council members, a partial bulletin reports is available in your mailbox this morning. A reminder of the details for the funeral for Ron Christensen this Tuesday. The service is being held from Hildale Lutheran at 1 p.m. And we thank Hildale for once again opening its doors to us in this way. Following the service, there will be a reception there. And also at 3 p.m., the family is holding an informal gathering, this time at the Branch 5 Legion. I've received questions, read the funerals for Donna Johnson and Teresa Wolofson. These services will be held sometime after the winter is over and spring or summer has arrived. And I'll share the details as the planning finalizes. Our National Church's daily devotional booklets for January to March are available in the front hall. And copies of the January newsletter are also there. We've moved that table closer to our old baptismal font so that you have more room to pick them up and also to read news on the bulletin board there. Thank you for helping already to fill the basket in the front hall for food. This will be given to the current River Church's food bank at the end of the month. And thank you once again to all who donated poinsettias to decorate our sanctuary for Christmas. There are still a few hardy souls left or not so hardy souls left. They're under our tree in the front hall, and you feel free to take home one or more of the remaining ones as you like. Marion Putin and Joan Riesenen and Peter Hintz are seeking your help in filling the nominations needed for our annual congregational meeting at the end of February. And Peter has an announcement about that this morning. Thank you, Pastor. On uh, page 10 of the book, uh, the order of service, there's a, a quick note on uh, the nominating committee. Um, I'm the uh, council rep on it, and of course, as uh, Pastor said, Joan Wilson and Marion are also on. Um, often, when a committee gets together, you're relying on their knowledge of uh, the congregation and uh, people's skills and background. Um, I suggest that maybe we, we put out a couple of notices to the, the congregation in general. You know, if you have skills or uh, interest in sitting on the committees, um, you know, please let Joan, uh, Miriam, or myself know. Um, you know and some of them, uh, we're, we've got the nominating committee, the, the financial review committee, um, and uh, the community care as well, the community care committee as well. Um, if you have time that you're willing to uh, to contribute and, uh, and participate, you know, consider it. And uh, if you're interested, please contact us. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. And the list is also in the newsletter. And Karen, yeah. you sat down, and wants to stand you up. Know, I think I'm to my seat. <laughs> um, I'm so confused. You can take off your mask to talk to me. <laughs> Elmer snuck in while I was out looking for this. 
sat in my seat, so I'm all confused. So then sat Peter's seat, and then he gets stuck and looks at me like, you're ready, my
and we'll leave the carry out for the season after Epiphany, the, the hymn of praise. This is the feast. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. This is the feast of victory for our God. First reading is from Isaiah, uh, verse 49, 1 to 7. Here the servant, identified as Israel, speaks for herself and describes her honored mission. Called before her birth like Jeremiah and John the Baptist, the servant is not only to restore Israel. The servant's ultimate assignment is to bring news of God's victory to the ends of the earth. God in faithfulness has chosen Israel for this task. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you people from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword, and in the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow, and in and his quiver he hid me away. And he said to me, 
you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord, and my reward with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survival survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deemed despised, the poor by the nations, the slave of rulers. The king shall see and stand up, princes and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful. The Holy One of Israel who has chosen you, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now we will sing uh, number 715, Him Christ be our life.
chapter 1, 1 to 9. Through God's church in Corinth is a fractious congregation beset with many conflicts. Paul opens this letter by spotlighting the multiple ways God has enriched and sustained its life as part of the divine call into the fellowship of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, called to be an apostle by Christ Jesus, by the will of God and our brother Synthius, to the church of God that is Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with those who are in every place, call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind. Just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He, is all, he will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the God.
Although the four Gospels contain many stories that are similar, each differs in describing the beginnings of Jesus' ministry. In Mark, we hear a mighty command to silence a demon. Matthew reveals Jesus giving a sermon to the crowds who have gathered on a mountain. Luke shows him in the synagogue, offering a quotation from Isaiah to proclaim his anointing for the year of God's favor. Over here in John, Jesus' ministry begins with a question. What are you looking for? Is a question continue to be directed to each of us? And in Jesus' response to our answers, we find a God who offers to sit with us, to listen to help us to learn and to live. John the Baptist has just declared that Jesus is the Lamb of God. And two of his disciples have decided to follow this new teacher. Jesus sees them and asks, what are you looking for? Now that is an awkward sounding question. And that it implies that the duo are searching for an object, something perhaps that they've lost. And that's not how Jesus understands the situation. He knows how John has described him. And he senses this curiosity here of these followers of the baptizer. Jesus invites the two to continue following asking them to share with him what they are seeking. This is a question that goes beyond their present curiosity. As one writer has put it, Jesus is asking, what is it that you really need? Not just on the surface, but deep down into the core of your being. What are you looking for? Life is full of routines, of expectations, of dreams, and of nightmares. If we can get on with the program, everything can seem to run smoothly. And when the train of life goes off the rails, it can turn into a bumpy road, even at times coming to a complete jarring stop. Sometimes we can pick ourselves up brush off the dust of life and get going again as we tend to or ignore our bruises. Yet there are other times when I sense we just sit there, unable to move. We wonder to ourselves and to God, what's this all about? We want to know. We want to know that there's more to life than the present. We want to know what it's all about. We are looking for that which helps us to get up once again. Deep down, I believe, we also want to know that God is there, helping us to rest, to breathe, binding up our wounds, staying with us until we can once more get up. These moments we keep looking, keep seeking, keep hoping for a divine response. I think we also can do this even in those times that are good, happy, full of promise. There are those who assure us that our success means that God is rewarding us, that we are following the right paths. Still, as we look around, instead of being satisfied, instead of being proud, we realize that we still don't have life figured out, that we still don't know how God wishes us to live. Is enough enough? Or are we to be looking further, doing something more? Indeed, is God really with us in all of this? The 
answer that the disciples give Jesus sounds off base. Where are you staying? Unfortunately, it's one of those passages in John that loses something in translation. The verb rendered staying more fully means living or abiding. It's the same Greek word the evangelist uses to suggest that Jesus is abiding one with the Father, and that those who believe will live, abide with Jesus forever. So that in this answer, we are to hear the disciples saying, Jesus, we want to be with you. We want to learn from you. We want to see more of what it means to follow you and to be your disciples, just as we have been with John. The two are asking for more than a brief encounter with this new rabbi. They desire to enter into a relationship with him that will take them far beyond what is their present situation. Jesus replies again somewhat cryptically, come and see. And this, however, he's not inviting them to come and see his lodgings. No, he's inviting them to come and stay, to live with him and to follow him, to learn from him, and to see God at work in him. To come and to see Jesus is to be invited in to enter into relationship with him living in the good news that here is the Messiah, sent by God to offer new life to us and to the world. Andrew does just that after the first day, inviting his brother Simon to come and to see as well. Jesus welcomes him and right away offers him a new name. He also is to follow to learn answers to the questions that he has in his heart, and to be part of this new growing community, this new relationship. There is always room for one more. So many things can be competing for our attention, including friends, family, activities, work, illness, or school. It can be difficult to balance all our priorities, especially when life isn't going that well. The good news is that wherever we find ourselves in life, no matter what we are facing, no matter what we are looking for, Jesus gives us this invitation also. He invites us to come and see, to see how our lives may be different with Him at the center. Amid our busy lives, Jesus invites us to live with Him, to learn from Him, and to see all that this relationship of love and acceptance can bring. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, you invite us to come and see. Guide us to come to you in every moment of our lives. Open our eyes that we might see all the ways you are at work in our world. Center us so that we can keep you at our center. Now let us stand as we're able and sing the hymn of the day. I love to tell the story. Number 661.
using the words of the Apostles' Creed, found on page 105. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called together to follow Jesus, we pray for the Church, the world, and all in need. Our Synod remembers in prayer the family and friends of the late Reverend Bruce Galhorn. Pastor Bruce recently retired from Grace Congregation in Winnipeg. He died this past Monday from health complications. His funeral is being held from Grace tomorrow evening. Put a new song in the mouth of your church, O God. Inspire the baptized to tell of your faithfulness sharing the good news of your salvation throughout the earth. Bless the witness of the good news in action through Canadian Lutheran Relief, its Executive Director Karen, and its staff. Merciful God, receive our prayer. The waters of baptism call us into life in the Spirit. Preserve the world's waters. Protect them from pollution. Support plants and animals who depend on them, and bring rain in places of drought. Guide us in protecting local waterways and in responding to devastating floods. Merciful God, receive our prayer. And Jesus, you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Show your mercy to all nations. Direct leaders to do your will. Fill governing bodies with righteousness. Equip judges with discernment and compassion. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You incline your ear to all who cry to you. Draw near to individuals and communities suffering violence, injustice, illness, or poverty. Hide them in the shadow of your hand, and make us signs of your faithfulness to all in need. Those we remember include Micah, Ray, and Eleanor, Elizabeth, Karen, and Glenn, Keith, Matthew, and June, Judy, Harvey, and Art, Dory, Fiona, and Eleanor, Audrey, Daniel, and Michael, Karen, Jeannie, and Jerome, Renee, Lawrence, and Larry, Jim, Marita, and Nick, Kathleen, Chris, and Donna May, Mike, Elaine, and Catherine, Susan, Linda, and Sharon, Ray, Linda, Nell, and Taylor, Jeff, Dorothy, and Lisa. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You invite us to come to you in prayer, even when we cannot find the words. Listen now to our silent prayers. Merciful God, receive our prayer. In every place and time you have sanctified your people, we praise you for the testimony of those who have died in the faith, including Pastor Bruce. Be with their families and friends, and strengthen us as we wait for the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We bring to you our needs and hopes, O God, trusting your wisdom and power revealed in Christ crucified. 
peace of God be with you always. Let us share a sign of Christ's peace with one another. gifts received and shared, we pray. Liberating God, you break the bonds of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Receive these offerings and thanksgiving for all your works of merciful power and shape us as people of your justice and freedom. You we magnify and adore through Jesus our Savior. Let us stand as we're able and begin the great thanksgiving found on page 107. of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come and taste the joy of God, the body and blood of Christ, given and shed for you. Please be seated as we eat the bread.